Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with a longtime friend, a very special guest, Justin Maris, founder of Kettle on Fire and Perfect Keto. Justin, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, man. So, uh, Justin, one of the things you, you've been thinking about uh, recently a lot is uh, is DDC brands, both in terms of investing in DDC brands, the, the uh, how DDC brands are, are overvalued, perhaps, relative to, to multiples, and then sort of building companies within the space. Why don't you sort of talk about how you initially uh, got into it or identified a big opportunity there, and then we could talk about sort of some of the macro. Yeah, for sure. So I kind of stumbled into this in 2014. Uh, I was just coming off an exit. We had a situation where we were selling software to software developers uh, called Exceptional Cloud Services. We exited that business to Rackspace. And kind of coming out of that, I was like, Man, I just do not care about selling like software yeah. to software developers. Yeah. Not my passion. Doesn't lead to interesting conversations, at least yeah. in my opinion. <laughs> and uh, so I was spending a lot of time like digging into health, wellness, longevity. Uh, I'd been paleo for a couple of years. I was doing CrossFit, kind of like the the healthy tech bro kind of stereotype yeah. that was kind of fulfilling. And so doing that, I came across this product that a lot of people were talking about for bone broth. Uh, went out there, saw that like no one had a product. Yeah. And at the time, I was like, cool, I'll start this bone broth business as kind of a side thing. Do it with my brother who's 18 years old, and then I'll use that to kind of fund my life while I figure out what I actually want to do, you know, which yeah. at the time I thought was start a tech company. Uh, and now, four years later, Kelm Fire is like a very real business. We've grown super fast, uh, especially in the CPG world. You know, we're, we're doing tens of millions in revenue and, you know, doing quite well. And yeah. so, through that experience and then launching another brand called Perfect Keto yeah. that we launched about almost three years ago now, kind of have formed an opinion around not only health and wellness, but just like what it's like to build and launch a direct consumer brand uh, in, in today's kind of landscape. Which yeah. Is interesting. And well, maybe just zooming out, like what's it like being a healthy tech bro? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. What, what, what sort of unique insights do you think enabled you to build Cat on Fire um, and the perfect keto, or like, what do you think you sort of uniquely, um, you and your team uniquely understand about building DC brands? Yeah, I think, I think that the core insight or core thing that I believe is like, if you look at the landscape of publicly traded CPG companies, like the, the companies that are responsible for 90% of the calories that people put in their bodies, uh, you know, a lot of these brands are not thinking about the health of the consumer in any mm-hmm. way. Like sort of, there's an extent to which Pepsi sells you a Pepsi for a dollar and their ability to do that is because they don't have to get exposed to any of like the negative externalities that they're creating by fucking up your health. You know what I mean? Like their ability to sell soda at such a cheap price is because they externalize the the bad things about that Pepsi on the U S healthcare system and don't have to internalize that. And so I think these brands like right now, if you want to get into the history of why this is, but um, I think that the, these big CPG companies right now are just structurally built to make their average consumer worse and not healthier. Yeah. And so, and has it always been like that or, or unpack some of the history behind it? Yeah. So basically like call it 40 years ago, um, these mega CPG conglomerates like kind of changed from being somewhat family, you know, there was some family ownership, there was uh, a, a different kind of like corporate governance mindset. And, and then sometime in the seventies or eighties, the sort of wall street ethos switch from, uh, building like good business, but to really, really increasing shareholder value. Like that was the thing. And the, the metric that they focused on was dividends per share. And so what all of these big CPG businesses did that you kind of see is all these guys have been around for a hundred plus years. Uh, and they all shifted their production and the way that they did things from, Hey, we're going to make products that are, that are kind of like mass market to we're going to see how we can squeeze the greatest amount of profit that we can out of each one of our product lines. So what that looks like is adding trans fats to all of their products, adding a bunch of artificial ingredients, processed stuff, just like the stuff that we know is making people super not healthy today and leading to a lot of the health issues that we have in the U S. And so because of that kind of like shareholder managed approach, 
Uh, none of these CPG companies today have any sort of CEOs that can actually say, okay, we're going to, we're going to shake things up. We're going to go in a new direction. 60% of these companies have had CEO turnover in the last like seven to eight years, which is crazy. And so you have these companies that can't innovate, can't innovate or can't uh, invest in the health of their products. Can't take these shitty ingredients out of the products they're making because then it would be more expensive, which then it hurts their earning per share, you know, which, which it kills their stock price. And they don't have leadership that believes they can accomplish anything. Yeah. So they're sort of like structurally stuck and unable to do anything that would lead to better health outcomes for people, uh, which is the market is moving more towards the health and wellness. Like that's something really important that these guys just can't yeah. respond. To. And if you were at, if you were a power player at one of these, uh, at, at one of these companies, um, what would you do? Or is it, is it just DOA? There's, there's nothing. Yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I would do a lot, but it depends on like the incentives are so tough right now. Yeah. Like there's just no way that anyone could walk into one of these big CPG companies say, here's my 10 year vision and the shareholders are going to buy in. Like you're basically saying, I'm going to increase the cost of the inputs that go in all these products by using higher quality ingredients. We're going to launch and incubate new brands that for three to five years are going to have no impact on our P&L. Um, you know, if you're Kellogg's and you're doing 16 billion in revenue or something, even if you launch a kettle on fire or something and you get to tens of millions after a couple of years, you know, us in startup land, we're like, sweet, this is like, this is dope. Uh, but if you're the president or CEO of Kellogg's, it's not even a rounding error yeah. on your business, you know? You just, you truly don't care. Yeah. So th- your opinion is they're not going to be public companies that are innovating because of just the structure of going public. Yeah. I, th- I think the, well, not necessarily the structure of going public. It's more because there are public companies that move incredibly quickly. Like Amazon is possibly the most innovative, fastest right. moving company out there today. Uh, but I think that if you look at public CPG companies in particular, almost structurally, they're unable to innovate. They have boards that will fire CEOs, the shareholders right. want you know, they don't believe there's revenue growth to be had, only profit. And, and I think that the incentives are just set up that no matter who or how good a person you put in there, they're just going to be set up to fail because they'll get churned out by their board within. Right. And, but what's different about the incentives for Amazon being a public company than, you know, a CPG company being a public company? I think that part of it is that big CPG, there's almost no ownership at the CEO level. Like yeah. these are truly companies that are owned by shareholders by and large. Uh, Amazon, there's like Facebook, you see kind of these like founder CEO figures that still have controlling shares and they've managed to grow the hell out of these businesses over the last, you know, 20 years. Like if you've compounded these businesses and taken Amazon from, I don't know how big they were when they went public, but to the largest company in the world at one point, uh, you kind of get a lot of, of forgiveness by, yeah. by shareholders, you know, but if you're the CEO of Campbell's and you guys have been shrinking two to 3% for, 10 years, like you just don't have a whole lot of runway and shareholders don't really believe them. And they're like, okay, I'm going to turn this around. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, in 2014, you didn't know that much about food, right? Uh, I knew about it as a kind of health interested right. consumer. Yeah. But, but uh, it, yeah, yeah not the operational side. And now you're the Elon Musk of CPG. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're <laughs> a power player in CPG. What do you think has enabled you to do that? Is it sort of you identified a uh, category or a couple categories of, of things that were, you know, on the rise before others did, or is it that you, you know, under, you know, you wrote the book traction, obviously, so you understood growth is that you understood distribution channel way, way better than other people did or, yeah. or both or, or something yeah. else. Or? Yeah. I, th- I think it's a combination of those things. Like kind of back to what I was saying, I think big CPG, which is effectively the, the, the people that everyone is competing with when you're starting a food brand is a big CPG brand. So like I said, these guys can't innovate very well. It's not meaningful for them to innovate. And so what they've done is they've left all of the growth opportunities and new and emerging categories for some other new entrance to chase. Like Campbell's wasn't going to launch a bone broth until it's a half a billion dollar category. And so what that means is like, one, I think that brands like ours are able to launch and quickly take advantage and scoop up a bunch of the uh, demand for some of these things like keto, like bone broth, like better for you products that big CPG is just not meeting. And then the second thing is I think that over the last couple of years, you know, it's been actually feasible to build a brand online via direct consumer, via selling on Amazon, all these kind of vehicles. Mm-hmm. Like to date, you know, even today, uh, something like 90% of all dollars spent on food and beverage happen in a retail setting. Yeah. And so 
even today, it's hard, but not, it's like just becoming possible to build a pretty meaningful food brand just selling to people direct to consumer. Yeah. But I, I, so I understand why the structural problems with CBG now uh, for public companies, but even startup land uh, um, have, you know, are you the first, the first people, the first credible people to build a bone broth company? Like why, why yeah. are there opportunities for taking that other people aren't noticing? Yeah. Great question. So I think that part one, uh, there was the opportunity for the taking. And then part two is I have a pretty good understanding of how to do growth marketing. Uh, I think that a lot of people, especially in our food space, like, you know, I came from technology background, you know, being in San Francisco and kind of being very, very involved in the growth marketing community here. And so for me, coming into the food and beverage space, it's like, you're not competing against the best in the world with these huge war chests. Like I came from SaaS, where we're competing against companies that are funded to the tune of you know hundreds of millions of dollars, they're paying people seven figure salaries to figure out how to grow and build you know build enterprise value of these startups. Uh, moving into food, like when we started Kettle and Fire, our two competitors were a husband and wife team that owned a CrossFit gym and were like selling bone broth on it as a part time job, and then another husband and wife team that were like nutritionists as their full time job selling bone broth on the side. So it's just a it's a completely different set of skills and type of operator that you're competing against. And what that meant for us is like our ability to build a direct consumer business. And we hired all people that had worked in, in marketing and technology. You know, we could just build a faster business. We understood online. We understand payback periods. Uh, we were pretty analytical. We just move a lot faster than a lot of the other companies that are kind of out there. What, what channels have you found are most effective or most successful yeah. Or company. yeah I think that's changed a lot when we started uh, influencers was probably the biggest one like you could email tons of these influencers who had small Instagram accounts or maybe a YouTube channel or an email list and say like hey we'll pay you you know 25% yeah. uh, or 20% of whatever you sell if you email your list about our product uh, a lot of them were excited to do so today it's kind of shifted influencers are becoming a crowded channel there's a lot more noise uh, and so what's working better now for us is, um, on the online side is Facebook, but you know, moving, we're, we're actually seeing more of a business shift into like a retail environment, at least on the kettle and fire side. Like physical retail? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do people underestimate how, how big that is? Or is that going to change over time or what's the sort of future of retail? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, I think about this a lot. I think that, I think it is going to change somewhat. Like if you look at apparel, for example, um, you know, apparel or uh, supplements might be a good comp. Like even in those categories, you know, it's it's anywhere between 50 and 70% of dollars spent in those categories are done so in brick and mortar retail. Um, food is 90, 10 right now. So you can see like, okay, that there's probably a path where e-com and food and beverage have, you know, will go from 10% to 15% to 20%, something like that. Uh, however, though, I think that there are some trends that are actually that make me kind of bearish on DTC and e-com in general. Uh, one, if you think of like Facebook and Instagram as sort of the, the new distributors of our day where you have to pay them in order to access a customer, kind of like you have to pay a distributor to get on shelf at Whole Foods or at Safeway. Um, the ad costs and the inventory for the, you know, Facebook and Instagram is going way up, like tremendous amounts over the last five years. Uh, and the second thing that I think is kind of a tough one is if you talk to anyone who's in the direct consumer space, they will tell you that last mile is the most expensive component of doing any sort of fulfillment. Like if you ship and you have a warehouse in Chicago and you have a customer in LA, getting a box of your product from Chicago to LA from one warehouse to another, relatively cheap. Like a lot of, you know, a lot of the cost has been stripped out of that, but getting it from an LA warehouse to someone's house, what's called last mile delivery uh, is actually very, very expensive. It makes up a huge percentage of overall fulfillment costs. And so I don't necessarily see that getting solved in the near future. And so you can kind of look at grocery stores in a way of being a place where consumers choose to get a lower price by doing last mile fulfillment themselves. I think that I'm more bullish on traditional retail kind of being a strong, like being where most of these like food and beverage dollars happen, but things like Instacart and some of these other services that some people pay for uh, be more convenient, doing things like shop online and then pick up at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods and the like. Uh, but I think that the economics of just last mile delivery, at least 
until there's some sort of autonomous last mile delivery robots or other things that come along make direct to consumer like that that's one tail or you know kind of headwind that i think makes me a little bearish on direct yeah. consumer and how does amazon interface or like who who are the big winners here who loses how does it yeah in, in this like hypothetical future of retail yeah. uh it's a good question i think i think that if the public markets keep underwriting amazon like they are where um, you know, they're, they're ascribing these huge premiums to them. Amazon effectively has unlimited amount of money to do whatever they want. Everyone thinks Jeff Bezos is like the best capital allocator in the world. And so for as long as that remains true, Amazon can and will probably lose billions of dollars a year just out competing these other companies uh, from a last mile delivery standpoint. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a weird thing where Amazon's doing one day shipping. Walmart's trying to do same day grocery delivery and both these companies are losing a ton of money yeah. doing that. Uh, and so I think as long as that, that proves true, like Amazon will probably be a good place to sell. You know, all the retailers that invest in that infrastructure will be a good place to sell, but you're still doing it through a retailer. Yeah. You know, that, that's why I think like, and, and the, the more these retailers invest in amazing same day fulfillment, next day fulfillment, last mile delivery, that's incredibly fast, convenient and quick. The harder it gets for uh, you know direct consumer companies to actually compete, yeah. because there's just not a third party fulfillment service today that's investing at the levels of right. Amazon, Walmart, and like. Yeah. Did you think Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods was a good business decision? Slash thoughts on Amazon's ghost stores or? Yeah, uh, I think it was a really good business decision. I mean, it sort of remains to be seen yeah. how that'll play out, but I think that Amazon needed a foothold in grocery. Stuff that they try to do on their own hadn't worked. Whole Foods is an incredible, incredible, uh, you know, they have great locations, great brand, great products. People spend a ton of money there. They have a restaurant arm, which is really interesting. So I'm, I'm like, I think that was a great acquisition. I don't know if you read, uh, Ben Thompson's trajectory had like a, but yeah, so he had this really good write up around Whole Foods being like Amazon buying Whole Foods and that kind of being the way that Amazon, uh, like Whole Foods being, they get to build their grocery infrastructure with Whole Foods as their own best customer, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I think that was probably a, a really, really good acquisition. As far as Amazon stores, hard to say. Um, I think that clearly if you look at, do people want to be standing in line to pay for things with cashiers? It's like, the answer is probably no. Uh, I mean, it's almost certainly no. I just don't know if, if it's true that, you know, the, the cost to operate this, cashierless store is actually orders of magnitude more than, um, than it is to oper- operate a store kind of the way that it's set up today. Uh, I would assume not. And I would assume that this is the way the store is in the future. I just don't know if that's like a five or 10 right. or 15 year kind of thing. Some people said that the Amazon Whole Foods uh, purchase sort of acquisition sort of spelled doom for the Instacarts and, and the other sort of, you know, gr- yeah. Gr- delivery startups. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree. I think that, uh, I think that that's kind of the immediate take. But the second order to take is like, okay, you have all of these massive retailers, Safeway, Albertsons, Kroger, Target, you know, Walmart, that are now incredibly incentivized to invest way more in last mile delivery. Yeah. Well, who's the biggest and best company that can get them there is, you know, the fastest is clearly Instacart. Uh, and so I think that you've actually seen, and I would guess that they've seen probably a renewed interest from a lot of their retail partners around, okay, we are willing to play ball with Instacart where going to view this right. as a strategic asset and not just like these annoying people that come to our stores and right. stare at their phones and pick things off the shelves, you know? Yeah, totally. It's funny. Um, Rappi in Latin America um, is sort of Instacart for Colombia and, and uh, broader Latin America. And some people spec- you speculate that, so they're, yeah, focused on last mile deliver- delivery. They could potentially be a wedge into getting to Amazon territory that if you own last mile delivery, maybe you can start to get into e-commerce more broadly because Amazon hasn't yet figured out last month ever maybe in the same way yeah yeah i mean I, I can totally see that i think that any point where you are interacting with the end consumer is you have the potential to kind of own that whole relationship yeah. and backwards integrate uh you know i, I don't know anything about rapi though so yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned um or you've written about how dc companies are uh overvalued in terms of multiple perspective in my opinion yeah. so uh say why yeah so i think that if you look at private market if you look at basically public market versus private market multiples uh, you kind of saw this with WeWork is sort of a, a way too weird example, but yeah. um, but kind of these other companies that have recently gone public, uh, where you've seen their private market multiples that they got in their last round before going public, 
then they go public and like they are trading small so direct club might be a good example here um you know where they're trading at a far lower multiple than they than their last private market valuation mm-hmm. uh i think you're starting to see this all over in direct consumer where if you look at some of the latest acquisitions that have happened in direct consumer then uh one there haven't been a ton of them but for the ones that have been you are seeing like multiples that are not incredibly strong whereas like you're seeing a lot of companies raise in the private markets at you know call it three to five x revenue multiple uh and that's in, in a for a business that's losing money structurally spending 60 to 70 percent of all the money they're raising on facebook and google ads and granting you know growing incredibly quickly so basically you're seeing like these companies are in an in an era where private markets valuations are so they're seeing like uh, direct consumer and, and some of these brands are not getting the public market comps that we necessarily thought. Consumer brands are getting sort of compressed uh, on, on the public market side. And so valuations are coming down on the private side as well. Uh, and so I think that there's, it, it's going to be hard for a lot of these companies to go out and raise their next round um, at anything close to a meaningfully marked up valuation. Like you just saw this with Harry's where they raised, I believe it over a billion dollars. And I think, 12 or 18 months later, they sold to Edgewell for like 1.1 1. 1 or 1, yeah. you know, 1.2. And so I think you're going to see a lot more of those things where they just kind of, they're happy to get their money yeah. out of these things. So a little, little bit of a shakeout. Yeah, in my opinion. I, yeah. And everyone in directing, everyone in like consumer brands it, that I've talked to is just kind of waiting for, right. you know, the music to stop on some of these. And so what happens after that? Like, what, so in the future, do you see like, you know, 10 years out, um, how do you think? So yeah. a little bit of shake out in the next few years. What, what, what's the next sort of wave? Yeah, I think that it, it's a good question. I think that the, the thing that I think is likely to happen is I think that the future of new brands will probably be omni-channel. Hmm. I think that direct consumer, like if you even think about it from a consumer behavior standpoint, do you think in the future that consumers are going to have like 30 different products where they go to 30 unique websites and they place 30 unique orders and manage 30 unique uh, subscriptions with all these different DTC providers, like probably not. Like I think that you're going to see a lot of consolidation in the direct consumer channel, whether that's on Amazon or some other like DTC brand platform. I'm not sure. Maybe even through Target, they seem to be getting behind direct consumer brands in a big way. But I, I think that you'll see far fewer direct consumer brands uh, kind of launching, especially launching in the way they're doing now, where they raise huge rounds, get yeah. pressed. I mean, there was a moment where it's like you just take a uh, you know, Warby Parker for X, just yeah, take, look totally. at, you know, your bed, your glasses, your trash can, like yeah. whatever. <laughs> and just, yep. If there's no Warby Parker brand, like brand, just, just go for it. Totally. Your couch, you know. And that's still happening. I mean, yeah. there's, there's like a thousand mattress brands or something like that. It's crazy. Uh, and so I think you'll see less of that happening. I think that you'll see brands realize that they need to run structurally sound businesses from a unit economic standpoint. And I think you'll see them moving into more channels. Like, you know, retail brick and mortar is still a huge percentage of where people spend money when they buy things. So yeah. I think you'll just see way more brands doing doing that, doing what Harry's did, going hard target, you know, moving into all of these different retailers. Uh, then you will see pure play direct to consumer, kind of like an away luggage or something yeah. like that is doing today. Is Target fucked? <laughs> or like <laughs> what happens what happens to these like, you know, mega sort of companies? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Um Target seems to be doing quite well. Uh, I think that, I think that like a lot of things, uh, you, you've had Alex Danko on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So I think his whole kind of thought around um, the middle being kind of hollowed out is an yeah. interesting one where I think that you're seeing a bifurcation of people who are, you know, they don't necessarily care about razors or a lot of the things that they're buying. And so like they want to go for the, where they can get the cheapest price yeah. possible. Yeah. So it's like Amazon, Target, Walmart, I think actually all can do pretty well. Uh, and then you have the higher end where it's like maybe direct consumer brands take over, uh, you know, for people, for like products that people really care about, say bone broth, you know, they're going to buy from their favorite direct consumer brand, whoever that might be. Um, I think who's the middle, I think in the middle is department stores that are like retail aggregators that don't necessarily offer Macy's. Yeah. Macy's JC Penny, yeah. you know, I, and, and I'm not a genius for saying yeah. this. Like these guys are already getting crushed. Saks Fifth Avenue, um, you know, things like this are going to have a really, really hard time. Yeah. And I think that effectively any like 
low level retailer aggregator that bases its strategic competency around we buy from all these brands and then sell to you is yeah. probably going to get completely killed. So you picked a couple categories within food. Um, you picked bone broth and picked keto. If, if there were five more of you or five more of your brother, are there, would you just, are there like a dozen more companies yeah. that you would launch like within food specifically or? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So like, how, how do you think about it? Yeah. I think, uh, kind of back to kind of back to what I was saying about public CPG, like these guys are not good at innovating. And so you can almost pull up a map of like, what products do they make yeah. that are high revenue people seem to like, but are really bad for people and say, that's going to be a category that we can wow. hone in on and do pretty well. So if you were building, if, if there were 20 of you and you were building, well, you could build two companies. So if there were 10 of you and you were like 20 consumer brand uh, companies, would like 18 of them be food oriented? Like, do you think food? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think so. I mean, I think that, and, and it's partially a personal reason. I yeah. think that what you put in your body determines, you know, yeah. most of your health outcomes. And like, yeah. I think that one of the biggest things that the U.S. needs to improve to be more internationally competitive, to like fix some of the internal issues that it has, is fix the problem that fundamentally so many Americans are incredibly unhealthy. Yeah. And that's a new thing relative to 40 years ago. Like I get there's genetics, I get there's a lot of other stuff involved, but if you look at U.S. health outcomes today versus them of 40, 50 years ago, something has changed and changed drastically for the worse. Wow. Like I think people need to explain that. And I think that if you start and say, I want to make the biggest impact on people's health, I think that food is a really, really good place to start. And so personally, that's why I want yeah. to start. And so let's get into that. What has changed or what has led to that? Yeah, I think... Uh, I think that it's kind of related to what I was saying earlier. Like you've seen a just profusion of additives, processed ingredients, uh, move towards packaged foods, move towards vegetable oils, high carbohydrates, high sugar things, uh, you know, high sugar products that have just completely taken over uh, the average American's diet. Like there are some parts of that country. My family's from kind of rural Pennsylvania. We live in Schwanksville, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's called Schwanksville. It's called Schwanksville. S C H W. Yeah. Oh my exactly. god. I know. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and so there's some parts like I go home and you literally can't buy healthy food. It's wow. just not available unless you want to drive, you know, 30 minutes to the nearest like store with a tiny organic section. But I think the proliferation of the options available to people, especially the options of the lowest cost, being across the board terrible for them. Uh, the widespread proliferation of vegetable oils, sugars, high carbohydrate foods, uh, and the the number of like pesticides and antibiotics and all this terrible stuff that kind of destroys people's gut linings, uh, glyphosate in particular, I think has created an environment where so much of what people are putting in their bodies is making them sicker but rather than better. Wow. Uh, and so that's just led to this explosion of uh, chronic illness diseases of inflammation. Yeah. Um, you know, you're seeing skyrocketing things in like obesity, autism, like all of these, these things that are just tremendously bad for the U S healthcare system yeah. and people in general, obviously. Totally. One thing you've written about is being the answer to the problems. The company you're really excited about is beyond meat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so you've, uh, you've tweeted, uh, it's gone viral, a tweet storm about uh, beyond meat and, and how these sort of new food, uh, or plant, you know, based, uh, meat companies are, are not the answer. Talk about, did you always think that they weren't the answer? Talk about the evolution, your own thinking around them. And yeah, then, uh, let's unpack the argument. Yeah, yeah. So I think that one of the things, stepping back a little bit, uh, I'm super pro Silicon Valley. I'm super yep. pro uh, technology, innovation, and all this stuff. I think that where Silicon Valley goes wrong when they look at food is Silicon Valley is very used to like building the future, right? And I think that when it comes to the human bio, you know, comes to the human body and human health, I think that in general, you actually are not looking to like, unless you're looking to build a superhuman, you know, do CRISPR gene editing or, uh, you know, do something around longevity. Like you actually don't need to say, I'm going to build this like uber human and build the future of humanity. What you need to do is say, people are fucking sick and unhealthy. The default state of a human individual, the human organism is actually to be healthy you know, it makes no sense for humans to have evolved in an environment where the default is uh, to be obese, to be unable to move. And you just don't see this in nature, like companies or individuals that are, expo you know, that we do studies on and we look at who are not exposed to Western diets and, and the like are generally very healthy. It's like the default of the human organism is health. 
And so when it comes to technology, I think you need to look at the human individual and not go, how do we build a future of you know, the human organism, but how do we get them back to a baseline state where they're healthy by default, which is not what we have today. Make America great again. Make, <laughs> <laughs> Make me sound like a Trump supporter. I know, I'm just kidding. But um, are, are we, we are living longer than we than certainly our ancestors did, right? Is that un, unrelated? <laughs> That's for other developments that don't have to do with the trade-offs that we've made around food? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're basically living longer than... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's effectively other developments. Like we're, we're now like our generation, you know, we're both, I think you're 30. Yep. Yeah. So our generation has a shorter life expectancy than our parents. And that's mostly due to disease and inflammation, chronic illness, where people used to get screwed, uh, and, and used to kind of die in the gene pool early was when they got killed by accident infection, you know, yeah. all these diseases of civilization that are unrelated to food intake. Like sanitation has come a tremendously long way. Um, you know, we don't have nearly as many deaths in childbirth and the like. Um, but, but going back to what I was saying is like, I think that the job of, you know, the question of like, how do we make America healthy again is not a technology question, but a question of food distribution, quality and the like. And so where I think Silicon Valley, including Beyond Meat and, and Impossible to get to, to mention what you brought up earlier, where I think these companies go wrong. So that's another good example of this is taking this super reductionist view of nutrition and saying like, okay, in the case of Soylent, uh, we are going to follow the FDA guidelines down to the exact percentage of like potassium, iron, you know, carbohydrates, all these things that you need, uh, or that the FDA says you need. And then food quality doesn't matter. Like we're going to use shitty vegetable oils. We're going to use vitamins that are, that are just like crap quality across the board, put it in a shake, you're going to drink it. And like, that's all that you need to, to be a healthy, optimized human, which I fundamentally don't agree with. Like, I think food quality is a real thing. I think that introducing massive amounts of things like canola oil, uh, which beyond meat, if you look at them, it's effectively like a pea protein and canola oil smoothie. I think introducing massive amounts of these ingredients that the human body has not right. been exposed to processing for the last, you know, 5 million years is just not optimal for human health and leads yeah. to a lot of human like sickness and, and suffering. If uh, Rob, the CEO of Soylent or, or some other person who's really excited about Memphis Meats or any of these companies were here, if it was the, if we were to steel man that argument, mm -hmm. what would that argument be? And then, and then let's do the, the counter to that. And I'll just start by saying, maybe they would say something like, Hey, you know, we've made amazing uh, advancements in understanding biology and, and the human body. And we've sort of reverse engineered some of, some of these things and we can, we, you know, we have, we have new resources and through technology, we make things better and we can make food better and, and we can feed more people at scale. Like what is, what is the best version of the argument that you can give in favor of, of, of these new, new types of companies and products? And then maybe your counter again. Yeah. I think the best version of this argument would be probably the ones that you're saying is like, we now understand biology. People are living longer. You know, we need something like this to feed the world, all this, uh, which I, I, I just categorically, <laughs> I don't think those are true. I think yeah. that in any case, in any case, like these companies are telling a story that, you know, is not saying this is optimized for, for human health and, and this is optimized for human driving, which is personally what I'm interested in. Like yeah. if someone is eating, uh, you know, Popeyes every day of the week or something like that, sure, maybe Soylent will be an upgrade for that person, but it still won't make someone, you know, perform at their peak levels or optimally healthy, yeah. which is kind of what I'm interested in. But are, are you fundamentally dubious or skeptical or that we, we couldn't, so maybe Soylent, these companies aren't the answer, but that there aren't other foods that we can engineer that better meet our nutritional needs for, for, for flourishing? Yeah. No. So I'm actually, so you mentioned Memphis meats. I'm actually super interested in what oh, cool. they're doing. Like, I think that the thing that I'm against, and I think Silicon Valley falls into quite often is this reductionist view of nutrition of like, the human body is this super simple or organism where you put 2000 calories out, you know, in, and then a perfectly healthy, optimized person comes out. I think that that's how Soylent looks at the world of like, you need a certain number of all of these ingredients, put them into the human body, out comes an optimized person. I think that the body is incredibly complex. It's a super complex system and it's evolved to work with, eat and, and digest and like thrive on a certain number of foods of which canola oil and a bunch of these other shitty ingredients, massively high carbohydrates, uh, huge amounts of sugar, like just don't fall in that picture. 
So I think that, you know, in, in a, in the future, I'm totally supportive if, you know, the, for me, the Memphis meets question is more of a question of like, can they get the cost down, uh, than anything? I'm not necessarily opposed to that here in, in want to learn more about, you know, yeah. lack of meat and the like, as long as the, the cellular structure is kind of similar, it seems that seems plausible from yeah. that standpoint. Uh, but I need to know more. It's more the reduction of approach to nutrition that I would say I'm not a fan of that I think is pretty short sighted. Right. You know, I remember reading, basically there's a school of thought that says we don't really know that much about nutrition. Like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, you know, like we've done the food pyramid a bunch of times. Um, and so in all of your study, what have you learned or where have you like within the ma- sort of ma- major, major debates about nutrition, where do you stand on? Yeah. I, I think that if you look at any nutrition study the, you know, one can be contradicted by the other and, and so much of it is funded by special interest. It's yeah. just like, I sound like a tinfoil hat person right now, I think, but uh, I don't mean to. I, I just, from digging into the data that I've seen, the current state of nutrition science is abysmal. Yeah. Uh, and it's so, so bad that to me, the only thing that I think makes sense is moving from a, like, what do, what does the latest research tell us kind of mindset to what does kind of, what is history and, and what do we empirically know about what leads to a thriving human? And I think from the last hundred years of research, we can pretty definitively say that the Western diet, which is based on high amounts of carbohydrates, high sugars, highly processed foods, does not lead to a healthy, optimal, thriving society. So I tend to lean towards, I think, like a paleo approach, uh, keto that like maps to sort of the, I think that the paleo lens on how to eat, like eat foods that your body has been evolved to digest process, you know, that, that it's evolved to derive nutrition from. I think about health and wellness almost strictly through the lens of like, does this make sense from an ancestral kind of health perspective? Yeah. If that makes sense. Right. Because Hey, we were evolved for, for, you know, previous environments and, and so whatever helped us thrive then will help us thrive now. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that if you look at the, the hardware of the human body, you know, we've been evolving for millions of years and only in the last couple, you know, all the last hundred years have people been able to access as, mu- as many carbohydrates and stuff as someone has in the current American diet. Yeah. And so our hardware hasn't actually evolved nearly as fast as our society and civilization has. And so I think that if you look at that and, and you believe that that's true, which I do, and you believe that, you know, the, the sort of like our organism, the, the human body organism has evolved to be healthy when it eats foods that are within, uh, that it's been evolved to eat. Like, I think that you end up in a kind of philosophical place where you're like, okay, even if we don't know everything about nutrition, which I, which we certainly don't, I'm going to play it safe and eat foods that we've been evolved to eat. I'm going to eat things that grow. I'm going to eat mostly organic. I'm going to like think about my health and wellness through this lens of, uh, you know, what, what is my body been designed to do over millions of years of yeah. evolution, which to me puts me in like the paleo way of eating right. and sort of an ancestral health mindset. So how do we do that at scale? How do we encourage paleo eating? Are, are there countries or communities that do enable, but th- that don't go back to hunter gatherers or something like yeah. how do you be modern? Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, I think one of the, the big questions of today, I mean, it's funny enough, like, Russia has committed to go fully organic <laughs> by 2025. Like yeah. there's some countries taking super pr- progressive steps. Yeah. Uh, you can look at Europe. They've put a lot of prohibitions around types of sprays, pesticides, uh, ingredients that you can and can't use in foods. Even Mexico has much stricter food safety standards uh, than the U S does around. Can you use glyphosate? Can you use all of these, you know, different pesticide sprays and the like different ingredients in, in people's foods. And so I think that, in general, unfortunately, being healthy takes a lot of work today. Like you have to learn about food quality. You have to internalize this, this mindset that I'm talking about. You have to go to farmer's markets. You have to care about your food quality. You have to, uh, you know, eat mostly organic. You have to eat low, low carbohydrate, low sugar. If you kind of, unless you're an athlete or, uh, disagree with me, which is totally fine or do well in high carbs. Some people do, but yeah, at scale, I think this is the problem that I want to spend my life working on is trying to make it so that every individual doesn't have to spend so much time thinking about how do I be healthy, but just the food options that are around them that they're most attracted to and excited to 
to eat are the ones that are also good choices for their health. Yeah. And like that's where I come back to building new brands and products that consumers want to eat because they're good and, and they also happen to be good for you. Yeah. And me, uh, maybe zooming out a bit, you're, you're interested in food, obviously you're interested in health and wellness. If you were running a fund or incubator, or, you know, had a lot of money under management directly focused on building big companies that help, help address any part of health, uh, wellness and human flourishing as it relates to that. What other either subsectors or spaces or companies or types of companies might you be interested in building or funding or yeah. seeing exist? Great question. Uh, I think a couple areas. I think that agriculture is, is one that has a tremendous amount of potential. If you look at the average farmer not using a whole lot of technology, you know, the farming paradigm for the last 50 to 60 years has been super focused on how do you use pesticides, uh, genetically modified seeds, you know, how you give Monsanto more money to improve your crop yields has been effectively the question. Uh, and I think that there's a tremendous amount of innovation that companies could do that take organic farmers and say, how do we give you guys the technology? Not like the monocropping soybean, corn and wheat growers, but how do we give these organic farmers uh, technology that allows them to leverage what they have and get more yield per acre? Uh, I think that that's a fascinating area I'm really interested in. Uh, there's another unicorn company called Indigo Ag that's doing really interesting stuff around using the microbiome of seeds to, to drive better yields and build a kind of a marketplace around this. I think that there's a ton of potential in agriculture. I think the other thing is you can look at things like farmer's markets, some of these other CSAs that are extraordinarily low tech, but that are doing a good job of connecting consumer to their actual food source. So I'm actually... I would do a lot more at looking at how can you provide farmers, farmers markets, consumers like the tools that allow them to connect to their farmers, get higher quality food sources, you know, whether that's at a restaurant, CSA, whatever it is. But like, how can you connect like these two parties in a much better way? And then obviously the brand side, which, yeah. is, which is kind of what I'm playing in. Totally. And talk a bit about Monsanto for, for a second. Why does, has Monsanto had the moat that it's had? Why is it evil? Slash, why does everyone hate it? And what, what could disrupt it? Yeah, I mean, I think that you're starting to see it get disrupted a little bit. But uh, the moat, I mean, it's effectively they've developed an incredible library of uh, you know intellectual property that they use and sue anyone that gets close to them. They've invested a ton of money in seed, spray, fertilizer, R&D. They spend huge amounts on lobbying every year. Uh, and effectively what they've done is they've created a system where many farmers are reliant on Monsanto for buying their seeds, buying their fertilizers, buying their sprays. Uh, and if, you know, if you've planted the same seed for 10 years, your crop yields are going down. You've been spraying the same field for 10 years. You're kind of out of luck. It's not like you can transition overnight to a different way of growing. Monsanto has you. They have incredible amounts of pricing power. Yeah. And so I think that a lot of people view Monsanto as evil because of this, this, Extortion. This extortion kind of relationship they have with farmers and because of the stuff where, you know, they're the ones creating a lot of these chemicals and pesticides and other things that uh, make their way into food that you and I eat every day. Yeah. I remember I took this class in college that basically it sort of was, I guess, the green revolution. Is that what it's called? Like, when did stuff go to shit and what would <laughs> cause it to go to shit? Was it this green revolution? You, are you familiar with sort of the history of yeah, yeah. this evolved? Yeah. So I've, uh, I've, I'm a little bit familiar, not that familiar, but. Effectively, it seems like in the call it 80s to 90s, uh, there started to be a lot more of these sprays happening, you know, organic agriculture and organic sort of kicked off as a counter movement uh, against this sort of mass commoditization of food uh, that really you started, you see start to happen in like the World War II era and then really pick up steam, start to move into pesticide spraying, you know, all of this kind of stuff uh, in like the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And largely because it was a way to more cheaply feed. More yeah. Water. I mean, I mean the yields were there. Like yeah. the, the thing that's interesting with agriculture in my mind is that, uh, and you, and you see this in humans too, like you can make short term trade offs and make tremendous gains, yeah. but over the long term, those negative externalities that you're kind of ignoring, like, Hey, we've 
sprayed all of our crops and we've gotten better yields for 10 years. Now it's year 11 and our yields are lower than they were when we started spraying. You know, our topsoil is is depleted. Uh, Our crops are like getting wiped out by these pests that uh, kind of evolve these super bugs that like to evolve to combat the pesticides that we've been spraying. And so you just expose yourself to more and more negative externalities the longer you go about doing things in a certain way. Uh, but up front, the efficiency gains are incredible. Yeah. And so I think we're just at the tail end of a, you know, call it 30 year, 40 year cycle of trading off doing agriculture the right way in exchange for in- improved yields, but, you know, with a lot more chemicals, fertilizers, yeah. all of this kind of stuff. Does it, does it mean you're also negative on GMOs? I, I kind of tend to side with like Nassim Taleb, who wrote the Black Swan. Um, he kind of talks about them from the standpoint of like what he calls the precautionary principle. Uh, I am against sort of cross and, and I, I'm not against, I'm skeptical of cross species, uh, sort of GMOs, like where you take a, a strain of DNA from a frog that, you know, kills a certain type of insect and you implant that into a, a certain strain of wheat so that like that insect no longer is attracted to, or that insect will die when he eats that wheat. That sort of like cross species stuff, uh, super skeptical of and makes me concerned. Uh, I think that if you look at GMOs from the standpoint of, you know, we're just taking things, uh, different traits and different alleles that lead to improved yields or hardiness or whatever within wheat and then propagating that across, uh, you know, a larger family of, of types of wheat or something like that. Like that sort of same species propagation, I'm not against for, for any reason right now. Yeah. Um, and so I think that my viewpoint on this is evolving, but I think that the problem I have with GMOs is that it's an incredibly broad label and people are having, you know, scientists will off, often come out in favor of GMOs and they mean like one thing and then right. someone will see, oh, there are four GMOs and, and they think they mean it completely other. It's just a, a massive spectrum yeah. that's all contained in one word that's pretty politically charged right now. Yeah. It's interesting. The um, I, I thought your frame was interesting of like you know, things that have short term benefits, but then you sort of externalize the cost onto something else. And you, you said there are other examples where, where this happens too. I'm curious, one, if there are you know examples that were top top of mind that, that come to you for that that maybe are non obvious. But then two, you gave this talk a year ago, maybe two years ago at this point at uh, Refactor Camp, the Ribbon Farm at Refactor Camp, basically about capitalism um, and <laughs> and and sort of. I'm curious if you can unpack some of the major points because they were related to this a little bit, you know, indirectly. Yeah. I think that one of the, one of the things that capitalism is currently not great at is things where broad value is created, but it's hard to capture. So if you think about public education, for example, you could say that there's a lot of broad value that's created and that you're, you're getting, you know, tens of millions of students are getting slightly smarter after a year of school. But that value is really, really hard to capture. And so historically, it's like we have not seen a huge, huge, huge company that has been able to say, like, make small improvements to a massive number of people and capture the value and become insanely valuable, at least in, in education. So that's a, I think that that's a class of problems that capitalism struggles to solve. And generally, the answer to these, how do we create broad value and solve problems that are important, but that are hard to capture uh, you know, from a, like a market capitalism standpoint is let government kind of do that. Uh, government tends to not be super efficient. I, I think that even the most anti-libertarian person could probably concede that. Uh, and so I think that what's interesting about crypto is that it has the potential to, by broadly measuring small amounts of value that are created, uh, actually unlock the ability of markets to capture this like set of problems that exist at creating value at broad scale, but, um, you know, where, where capitalism today doesn't really do a good job capturing it. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes. Um, where are we right now in that, in that vision or, or... Oh, we're super early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I gave my crypto talk in 2017 with yeah. like Bitcoin is pumping like crazy, right. you know, totally. I think that we're super early. Well, and so what does the world look like in a world where, where that happens? Uh, I think it looks a lot like today, except that the sectors of today where they've gotten more expensive, that, feel like capitalism is broken, healthcare, education, housing. Uh, I think ideally those sectors are sort of have market forces unleashed on them. And that means driving costs down, innovation goes up, you know, 
outcomes for humans are better than they are today. Like that's my hope. I, I, I think that one of the things I'm most bullish on or interested in over the next decade or two is I think that the sort of race for national or international kind of supremacy is conditioned on how well different governments can get the power of markets to like serve them so that they can outcompete other governments. Like yeah. I think you see Singapore uh, going from pretty backwards, you know, not, not super wealthy place to one of the richest per capita countries in the world right now. Uh, and in my mind, that's mostly due to the fact that they've adopted a very pro markets, uh, you know, pro capitalism policies in some ways. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of potential to unlock massive amounts of wealth over the next, you know, several decades just by doing a better job of unleashing human creativity. Yeah. Uh, in these areas that totally. currently feel kind of stagnant. The interesting thing about Singapore is it's also authoritarian in some ways, totally. in some sort of social ways to, yeah. to ensure, you know, good behavior. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's, it's a very interesting place. Like yeah. I don't, I'm not a staunch libertarian and yeah. like market solve everything person. I think that, uh, but I do think in, in industries and situations where a lot of human inertia is wrapped up in politics, yeah. like there's tremendous potential to have, so markets just pull innovation of totally. these sectors they haven't seen. Yeah. The two sort of question, two big questions I have around markets. One is the environment. Basically, you know, I read Jeffrey West's book Scale, and he says, "Hey, you know, markets are inherently unsustainable, and that you just keep having to, you know, ac- you exponentially innovate until there's some singularity, and and they're sort of at odds with." Um, a stable environment um, because it's too complex of a system and, and you're imposing sort of a complicated problem set around a complex thing that you can't really reduce. Uh, there's so many moving parts and, and you know, markets re- reduce value uh, or, or, or reductions inherently. And then there's the other argument. Andrew McAfee just came out with a book called More From Less that the, you know, the only way out is through. You can't go back to where we used to be and you need to innovate your way through this and so better energy, you know, cheaper and, and that we've already done this or we already started to decouple resource usage, uh, from consumption and that we're sort of, um, you know, using less for, or, or using, you know, more for less, or, um, than, than we used to. That's sort of one big question, the environment. Uh, the other question is more similar in terms of, you know, in Silicon Valley, they say measure what matters. That's sort of the John Doerr quote, but what matters what truly matters in life, like the most meaningful moments in your life, like aren't, you know, can't really be measured. Um, and in fact, are somewhat cheap, like money is a commodity. Money makes everything equal. If you only spend time on what matter, what you can measure, because it's like, you know, if you don't measure, it, it won't matter. If you only spend time on what you can measure, then you won't spend time on what you can't measure. But if you measure it, you somewhat cheapen it. And the, so is the answer to have like metrics for everything? Is the answer to just acknowledge that these things, you know, interpersonal relationships uh, it, between people, between people and environment can't really be metric, you know, put into a metric and thus you find another way to value them. Those are sort of my two hang ups on, on what we do there. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I, I tend to agree with, uh, uh, Andrew McAfee that like the, the only way out is through, I think that any situation, any, any person who's like markets don't work, there's a structural issue here. Uh, they sort of pre, in my opinion, and I could be missing something, but the reason that I don't think that is a really valid critique is because in order to solve that, it sort of presupposes the existence of some crazy higher power that can just say no more development from here on out, no more markets, no competition, no, no desire to, to get a, an edge over another company, another individual, another, whatever. Like I think effectively, as long as humans are status seeking animals, which yeah. it, I don't see any that change anytime yeah. soon you know, markets are just a function where people get to compete for status. Like that's effectively all the market is like, am I making a better product than you? Uh, does someone else want to buy this thing? Um, and, and I think that as long as those things exist, there's just no other way that we're going to get through this problem than, uh, innovating at a faster pace. I think yeah. the only other way that we can try and fix some of these things is by measuring some of the negative externalities that are created in force, you know, in the kind of path of trying to innovate, trying to do more. Like if you said, uh, like I think carbon credits are a pretty good example here of, okay, you know, we are broadly saying for 
industries and countries that are pro carbon credit, pro carbon credits, we're basically saying like, you can do whatever you want. You can make steel, you can like manufacture cars, we can do whatever, but there's this other cost, which is borne by the rest of the populace at large in the form of, you know, environmental degradation. So in order to offset that, we're going to force that you buy these carbon credits to capture somewhat this neg- negative externality that previously you were kind of just like free riding on. So I think that we're going to develop more and more systems like that, uh, especially as things get easier to measure, as you mentioned. But uh, but I think I just tend to think we'll align way more with the Andrew McAfee and like yeah. accelerationist kind of point of view. Acceleration. Do we do you not worry about a singularity or? I personally don't think I ha- I can do anything to fix yeah. that. Like I can donate to Miri, maybe yeah. I've done a little bit of that, but uh, but I think my like skill set and aptitude for things is totally not matched with preventing an AI apocalypse or something. Yeah. And is the you mentioned you humans are status seeking uh, you know creatures. Is how do you think the difference between belonging and status? Is belonging just sort of like the positive sum framing of status? What is the difference between belonging and status? What do you mean? Uh, like belonging, like humans are constantly needing belonging, mm-hmm. and humans are constantly seeking st- is status. Like re- status relative to other people, and belonging is sort of like you don't think of belonging relative to other people. Yeah, I tend to think of humans as kind of having an internal and an external mode, uh, and so I think that the internal mode is sort of like how fulfilled am I feeling? How, you know, am I in a meaningful relationship? Am I, you know, what is my experience of relating to my internal emotions and sort of like hedonic barometer of where I should be in life. And then there's sort of the status seeking element. Like you can both feel, wow, I feel like an incredible sense of belonging and depth and uh, richness in the relation, in this relationship with my partner. But I also see my friend has, someone who I think is, you know, he's dating someone who I think is hotter yeah. and like that bugs me. Like that's sort of a conflict between your internal mode of being and externally. Like, do I feel like this person has higher status than I do? Um, yeah, I think that's maybe not a great example, yeah. but I think that it's sort of ingrained in us as competitive status seeking, uh, creatures that are living in meat bags that evolved, you know, yeah. millions of years ago. It's sort of just like something we have to get. Yeah. Out. Interesting, the sort of idea that we were wired, and maybe we're wired this way because hey, resources are scarce, and you need to get them. Make sure yeah. that you, you you get them, and that you you know um trans- you know pass on your genes. Is um uh, and today we're we're sort of wired for scarcity in a world of increasing abundance, mm-hmm. and so how do we sort of you know culturally rewire yeah. that framing or or adjust in some way? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think I think it's one of the interesting things is that. Uh, you, at least I look at a lot of the issues in the country today and a lot of them appear to be diseases of abundance. Like yeah. no longer are people dying of starvation, which, which they were, you know, hundreds of years ago, at least not as many. Yeah. Um, but now the bigger public health issue is obesity. Yeah. You know, you're, you're seeing kind of the same thing of like people were, were now just diseases of abundance are everywhere. Like people are making more money that's not making them happy. They're living yeah. in larger houses, which is separating them from people that they once cared about and would, you know, share a, a small kind of living environment with. Yeah. But there's just a lot of issues that uh, I think stem from our scarcity mindedness. Yeah. Creatures living in, like you're saying, like a world totally. of just total limits. You've gone relatively deep in, in evolutionary psychology and, you know, the internal external frame was interesting. I mean, a few years ago, you sort of referred to emotions as feedback loops in some sense. If you still think that, but what is sort of your research and reading into evolutionary psychology helped you understand about uh, people or, or yourself in ways that you uh, operate? And, and I'm curious how that has changed behavior at all. Like for example, there are questions of when do you sort of you know, design for your evolutionary instincts? Like, Hey, they're just going to happen versus when do you say, Hey, I'm just going to like, I know I'm wired for that, but I'm going to do something else. Or, yeah. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the eternal struggle of being yeah. human is like, totally. you know, Kahneman's like system one versus system two kind yeah. of always in conflict. Uh, and but, system one being what we're evolutionary designed to do. Yeah. System one being sort of like your gut reaction of, you know, you slighting me and me feeling like, Oh, that, you know, like getting angry versus yeah. system two being like, Hey, let's discuss this in like a nonviolent communication yeah. framework and, and work through stuff. So what it's taught me, I think that, I think that one thing I have learned a lot about, uh, is basically 
I think a lot about emotions as feedback loops. I tend to think that, uh, you know, from an evolutionary psychology standpoint, I, I think it's interesting if you think about emotions as emotions are useful to the extent that they create this activation energy that allows you to overcome inertia. Like in mm-hmm. some sense, uh, you can imagine, and caveat, I don't, obviously don't think depression is good. I'm not saying anything like that, but in some sense, you can imagine that there are people whose behaviors are creating lives and outcomes that are just not good for them. They're mm-hmm. eating poorly. They're not working out. They're not socializing. They're not doing all of this. And if to the extent that someone just doesn't get a feedback loop of emotions of like, wow, I'm kind of depressed about this. They have no incentive to change anything about their lives. Like one of the most powerful periods in my life was, uh, I went through a really tough time where, you know, went to college, my dad lost his job. I got, you know, I like broke up with a long-term partner, a friend committed suicide. It was like a, just a ton of stuff, uh, and got really, really unhappy. And coming out of that, I like, that was the first time in my life that I invested in my health. I invested in working out. I invested in joining social groups. I like started doing my own entrepreneurship stuff in college, you know, which didn't work out at all, but you know, cause I was young and dumb, but still it put me on a path that today I'm, I'm super, super grateful for. And if I was kind of ignoring that emotional feedback loop, which I think a lot of people do, uh, then I, I would have missed this whole kind of flashing red sign of like, you need to change something about yeah. your, the way you're looking. And life. how do you determine when these emotions are sort of like bugs of like, Hey, I'm distracted to this person because that's what my, I'm designed to do or <laughs> versus, versus like, Oh, this is telling me something deeply in like, cause I feel like they're often we go to either extremes of like, Hey, trust your gut and everything. Yeah. Or like, Hey, just rationality yeah. <laughs> solves all your problems. You know, yeah. how do you, how do you think about, yeah, I kind of think, I think that there are some systems that like attraction to yeah. other people is probably one. That's a good example. I don't necessarily think that humans were wired to be in monogamous, long-term stable pair bonding situations. And so for me, if I feel like, whoa, this other person is super attractive, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, that's not something that I'm like, Ooh, I must act on this. This yeah. must mean that my, my relationship with my partner is totally yeah. messed up. Totally. Like, I'm attracted to someone else. Yeah. What a disaster. Uh, I, I think that there's some things that, you know, as a society and as people we've chosen to invest in and ignore some of our baser impulses Vi- a lot of violence probably falls into this category. Um, but I think that on the flip side to many people's emotions, uh, people kind of view as like, what a burden, what a terrible thing, but I think that they can be incredibly useful, uh, tools mm-hmm. to like create a better life that you will be happier with. Yeah, totally. So it's sort of analyzing a contextual basis of, Hey, if I, is this telling me something that could be useful? Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So if, what, if it's with romantic partners, maybe not. Yeah. Stuff, <laughs> stuff, like, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You didn't go to an Ivy league university. No. <laughs> What I'm curious about your story is that from the outside, just looking at the main stats, it wasn't sort of obvious that you would be this very successful entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm curious, how do you identify other Justin Maris's out there? Like who, who mostly not necessarily like on paper have, you know, Harvard or, or yeah. whatever it is, um, or come from a certain family or something. Like, what do you think it was about? Like, what traits about yourself would you look for in, in other people or different versions of them that you say, Oh, this person's got yeah. real potential. <laughs> I think it depends. Like, I, I think one of the things that characterized my, uh, kind of college Justin and then early twenties version was I was just maniacally obsessed with making money, not in a like fuck someone over way, but just from the standpoint of, I had this crazy scarcity mindset around, not wanting to fail, not wanting to have money issues. Like, you know, my parents kind of had that oftentimes growing up, uh, added a lot of stress to the family. And I, I wanted to just not be exposed to the same set of situations. And so I think that I was so driven to hit a certain amount of like financial comfort that it was pretty obvious to a lot of people that got to know me early in my twenties. And I was like super lucky that I had a lot of mentors that saw that and kind of said, you know, Hey, making money on everything, like build yeah. these other aspects, become a good person. Um, but we're also willing to help me. 
uh, achieved some level of success. Like, I think that they kind of saw how badly I wanted to be successful and that I just kind of wouldn't stop until I'd sort of gotten somewhere that I wanted to be. Uh, I don't think it was necessarily the healthiest thing yeah. uh, at all, but I think that one thing I've come to appreciate now is like, if you are someone that says, this is the thing I'm going to do in the world and you set your mind to that completely, things tend to work out really well for those right. people. So yeah, look for people who are unhealthy. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, not entirely wrong. <laughs> I know, but it's funny because there is a sort of like, if you see someone who's young and like really well-rounded and really at peace, it's like, do you really have the... The dr- like sometimes not to say there aren't you know lots of people and being being healthy you know if you're too unhealthy then you can't do anything right but yeah. they're like the chip on the shoulder has some truth to it yeah and no chip on the shoulder not to say that they can't be really successful but sometimes there's a bias there that like hey what do you what are you trying to prove if, if not, like what are you going to work really hard for totally i mean being I mean, great takes sacrifice <laughs> yeah. yeah and i think there's different types of success like i know okay. a, a bunch of people that are incredibly well-rounded have hobbies and friends and just yeah. like all of these things and they've started their own businesses and are really happy, Yeah. but they're not, they're also not playing the same game I'm trying yeah. to play of like, totally. you know, start a company that scales super quick and try yeah. to make a big impact and all this kind of stuff, Yeah. which is fine. So you wrote the book Traction uh, in 2014. If, the, if, you, if that was written in 2019, what would be different? Oh, so much. What, I mean, what's changed? If you read that book, it's effectively the first five chapters are like, here is how, here's how to think about approaching the problem of like, how do I grow my company? Uh, I think that those five chapters still stand pretty well on their own. Uh, and then we did 19 chapters about the different traction channels you can use to grow. And in them, it's like Snapchat appears to be a thing. Some teens are, you know, it's just like all of the platforms that we wrote yeah. about have completely changed the, the approach, the economics, the cost, everything has changed. Uh, especially in like a lot of these big platforms, you know, when we were writing, it was sort of unclear. You know, we talked about display ads at one point. Huh. Uh, there's almost nothing you can do to grow a business purely on display ads. Yeah. Uh, all of the money in ads goes into Amazon, Facebook, Google right now, yeah. um, and with very few exceptions. So I think that that's the biggest thing. It's like the channel mix and the way that you need to think about growth today versus five years ago has just completely changed. Yeah. Say a little bit more about that. What channels are you most excited about or think have most long-term premise or you think are actually drying up? Because mm-hmm. it seems hard to grow consumer things right now. It seems like the channels are... I think it's incredibly challenging. Like right. What you're seeing right now is uh, most consumer companies are, are trying to focus on uh, increasing their lifetime value, which is why they're launching product extensions, launching memberships, launching subscriptions, launching all this kind of stuff so that they can uh, validate a higher customer acquisition cost on Google, Facebook, Instagram, and the like. And so I channels that I'm excited about today, I think a lot about sort of the reaction trends to mega trends in the country. So like more and more people are spending time on social media, you know, spending more and more hours of their day on social media, on, on apps and all this kind of stuff. Uh, what's sort of the reaction trend to that? Hmm. I'm actually becoming really bullish on in-person communities, which the, in, the internet facilitates that really, really well. And I feel like there's just an explosion of these of opportunities to get engaged in in-person or virtual communities uh, that as a brand or as a marketer, you can kind of latch onto and say like, hey, you have an audience of people doing paleo stuff in San Francisco in this WhatsApp group or Facebook page yeah. or whatever it is. Let's figure out a way to work together and kind of help both, you know, help one another win. Like I kind of think the future of a lot of marketing um, at least in the early stage, especially in the early stage, tends to be more community based. And I think the internet makes that easier today than it ever has been. Yeah. And how do you expect that to evolve over the next, over like the next five years, next 10, if you were at traction in 2024? Yeah. Uh, I think that it's a really good question. Um, I think that likely you are going to see, I think marketing effectively follows people's attention. And so uh, I think that you're probably going to see uh, the next layer of advertising platforms come up on places where people are spending attention, which to me looks like Twitch, TikTok, YouTube, podcasts. Like you, you have a lot of these areas that are getting a outsized amount of people's attention, but a minuscule amount of media spend relative to the amount of time spent on them. 2012, like TV, uh, amount of time spent watching TV versus the amount of dollars spent 
in that channel as a function of like total amount of human time, I was pretty well matched. Like Mary Meeker has this really good graph on, you know, how much people are, how much time are people spending watching TV versus how much money is going to this channel. Uh, and there's a huge gap where people are spending way more time on Facebook and way less money was going into advertising on that platform. So I think you just want to look for those gaps where there's massive amounts of attention going somewhere where that attention has not been totally priced in because it's somewhat illegible, which yeah. for me, I would think about right now is like esports, TikTok, um, YouTube, stuff like this. Yeah. It's interesting. We were sort of waiting for the big, and maybe it was Gimlet to Spotify, sort of the big outcome in podcast or the waiting for yeah. it to be tipping point in terms of, you know, what to invest in or when it's really going to take off. And it's taken off in China, but we'll sort of, we'll see here. One thing you've also thought a lot about is, is validating startup ideas. And uh, as you know, I run the OnDeck community for people who are looking to start their next thing. And so they are constantly thinking about what to do next, what sort of spaces, how to validate. What do you, what do you think you understand about validating a startup idea or what's your sort of philosophy behind it? Yeah, I, I think that there are kind of, I think about things in two buckets where you effectively want to validate a startup idea to solve one of the biggest risks that that you're going to take on when you're trying to build this company for kettle and fire. Our biggest risk was that there's actually not a market. No one wants bone broth except for Justin Bears, you know? And so for us, what we did is we created a landing page. We bought ads. We like drove people to this, this landing page that was selling a product that didn't exist yet. Uh, and based on the numbers that we ran, we were like, okay, you know, we can spend call it $15 to acquire a customer. We'll make $30 in profit. Uh, there's X number of searches for bone broth and bone, bone broth related terms on a monthly basis based on our like three weeks of buying ads. We can expect to capture a certain amount, which means we'll probably end up with at a low, you know, in a base case scenario, a three to $500,000 a year business. Like that was kind of the math that we ran and how we thought about it. Uh, so I think if you're trying to do something that has market risk, doing kind of smoke tests like that can be really, really useful. I also though, think that there are other companies like Open Door where it's like that's not really a market risk problem as much as it's a execution and, and fundamental unit economics problem. And so I would validate that company in a very different way. How would you think about validating that type of company? Uh, I mean, not Open Door specifically, but execution risk companies. So execution risk is almost all about people and yeah. the amount of funding that you can throw at something. Uh, at least in my naive opinion, uh, having not done one of those companies. Um, I think that the second piece I would think about is just look at the, the core economics of the industry. Who's making money here? Where's the profit coming from? Where's your like advantage relative to competitors in the space? And I would talk to as many smart people as yeah. I can saying like, this is what I think is happening in this industry. Do you think that this approach makes sense? You know, yeah. talk to investors, try and get really, really smart people to put their money in their minds on is what you're talking about actually true or not. Totally. You're just a very thoughtful person in terms of how you spend your time, how you think you can have the most leverage or sort of do the most leverage work. You know, now that, you know, Bone Broth and, and Keto have had some success and you've had some prior success and you'll obviously be building and scaling these companies for, for quite some time. How do you sort of approach where sort of it's most effective to, to spend your time in terms of like yeah. what you pursue what, what your mission is, like, how do you sort of thought about that or evolve that over time? Because it can be sort of a bit daunting and that is my, you know, do I need to solve climate change? Do I need to yeah. <laughs> like prevent AI from taking it? Like, there's just so many things like existential crisis, you know, salt, longevity, right? Totally. How do you, how do you even approach that? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I, this has been kind of a, an emerging thing I've been learning about. Like I stumbled into doing kettle on fire four years ago. This is not, not, this is not part of like, my grand plan, you know, I thought I was going to be doing something in technology and then have the side business. It started to take off. I started to spend more time there. And then kind of, as I got deeper and deeper into this problem or into, into growing this company, I saw more and more problems in the CPG space, the agriculture space, the, the food space, you know, everything. And so now I kind of think about things from the standpoint of where am I uniquely capable of doing something? Uh, like I, I kind of have this, this thought of around like impact versus replaceability. Mm. And so if you think about like an X, Y axis of impact versus replaceability, like high impact, but fully replaceable person would be, uh, someone who is incredibly high impact, uh, makes, 
big decision, maybe like a senator or a chairman, but like maybe relatively replaceable in, in some way where it's like if you put in a different congressman or a different senator, the outcomes might not be that different. Doctor would also be like a good good example here of like someone who has a huge impact on a patient's life. Swap it out with another doctor, like maybe it doesn't make that big a difference. So I think that you want to aim to operate in this zone of like really high impact where you're also really hard to replace. And just based on what I've spent the last four years doing, uh, I'm leaning more and more towards my sort of zone of highest impact and uh, hardest to replace being something at the intersection of like technology, food and health and wellness. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so for me, I don't really have a grand plan around what that looks like Uh, as much as I just want to spend time in that space, kind of chasing down opportunities I think are compelling that also help improve the health wellness of people in the U S by potentially fixing a small chunk of the food system. Yeah. Do you see yourself getting into longevity in a more direct way or do you think that that's the way that you would? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that there's so much work to be done in the healthcare and food systems. Uh, but I think that if you said, okay, Justin, you have a 50 year career to try and solve this or like try and improve in some way, this thorny problem of like people are sick because they're not, they don't have good food inputs. Like if you, so the more and more you solve that problem, the more that company and that, that larger problem of like how you make people healthier turns into a longevity problem. And so I think to the extent that the food system gets better and people get healthier and suffer less from chronic disease, the more time I would want to exp- like spend and explore uh, doing things in longevity. And what, what could that look like? Oh, uh, no, yeah. <laughs> I think I think that, yeah, I mean, this kind of is another rabbit hole, but I think that there's a lot of ways that basic scientific research could be a lot better. Yeah. And I think that it might look like doing something in that area, whether that's right. sponsoring individual scientists, whether it's getting really involved in genetic, uh, you know, gene therapies and stuff like this that I think are pretty promising. I don't know, but, uh, that's kind of what I think about right now. Let's go around a little bit of this rabbit hole. You, you have sponsored some, some research. Yeah. Maybe talk about some of the research that you sponsored. Why out of all the research you could sponsor, you funded that and maybe where science is broken and how you think it can be fixed. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I'm no expert on like where science is broken. I don't really have good thoughts around how it can be fixed yet. Uh, but I do think that there is, there are a large, relatively large number of people that want to do research that have good ideas, but that are also not parts of mainstream academic institutions. And so can't get their research funded, can't spend time researching different things because, uh, you know, because they're not independently wealthy or whatever it is. And so I've funded now just two people giving them like small kind of grants to work on a given project uh, that, that I thought was exciting. They were excited about it. It seemed plausible to me as a super unscientific, uh, you know, broth moron. Uh, and just was like, cool, if, if you are struggling with, you know, getting your living expenses covered, but you really want to chase down this thing that's kind of interesting, uh, I would like to support that. And so I, I'm interested in funding the, the set of people that have interesting ideas from a research standpoint, but just no institutional backing that yeah. will allow them to get a grant or, or, you know, spend their time doing it. Can you say more about the ideas that they're pursuing and what you hope that comes out of it? Yeah. So I, this is way more of an experiment for me yeah. than anything. So, uh, the, the two people I'm funding, like one is looking at basically the way that the microbiome, uh, it interacts when, when exposed to like when someone takes psychedelics. I don't know that there's anything that comes out of that, but he seems to think that there's promising potential avenues where uh, psychedelics could be related to schizophrenia and some of these other mental degenerative diseases. But yeah, I mean, he seems to think that it's plausible that you could treat some of these uh, conditions with psychedelics and that it's related to the function of one's microbiome. So like, those are all things I'm super interested in. So why not? I don't know if something will come out of it. Uh, you know, the only thing I've asked of these people is that if a company gets spun out, I get to invest in the first round at like sort of a predetermined valuation. I don't, I don't know if anything will come of it. Then the second one is a brain computer f- interface project. Uh, this guy has been doing a ton of research, basically hit a wall uh, due to living expenses, got, had to move for his family, his wife's family. And so, 
uh, got pulled out of the institution that he was in and is just kind of like stranded. And so randomly got connected with him and was like, let's set up a tranche to fund, you know, like let's fund these three milestones and see if you can build something interesting in an area that you're, you're, you've gone super deep on. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. This is like as of a couple months ago. And you got connected just because you went through some threat Reddit threads or something. I don't know. How'd you, (laughs) yeah. So I I actually reached out to this one guy, uh, Alexi Guzzi that wrote a blog post around like why science is broken. Uh, and then he and I just got to chatting and I was like, well, if you know anyone that needs funding, I'd love to chat with them. Uh, and then he put me in touch with these people. And so I funded them. Yeah. I like, I like that kid. Yeah, uh, too. <laughs> he, he's coming on the podcast soon. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So another thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, you moved to Austin uh, a few years ago. Are you a year ago? Yeah. Talk, talk about first, how you use San Francisco? Are you long San Francisco? Cause right now there's sort of all this chaos. Yeah. You know, we just elected this sort of crazy person. Yeah. Like you have this person. Are you long short San Francisco? How do you think about cities in general? Um, U.S. China. I'm just kidding. <laughs> your, your take on geopolitics. Yeah. yeah, why not? Um, I think, I think that San Francisco is shooting itself in the foot in many ways. I am short San Francisco in every possible way, except the one thing that I'm not sure about is, is the density and network effect of incredible people too great to be overcome that at least for the next decade, it, it's really hard to build a, billion dollar plus startup anywhere else in the country. That might be true. It might be true that San Francisco is both like I am short San Francisco and it, it keeps working for another like one to two decades. Yeah. I think that if without change in the politics, like the number of the number of self-sabotaging situations that or decisions that uh, the board of supervisors has made and, and everything is just kind of baffling. But it also like, this might be kind of a turning point where you could imagine things are pretty bad. There's also some signs of like, you know, London breed was saying that she had a plan to get 4,000 mentally ill, uh, people some help and get them off the streets. Like maybe we're starting to turn a corner now, uh, now that some people are actually leaving and, and there's real tech pushback on some of these issues. I don't know. Uh, I'm really hopeful. Yeah. Are you, have you looked into charter cities at all? I have. Yeah. Or startups. What, what do you, think about them do you think they're practical anytime soon or yeah i think i think they're incredibly interesting uh, i think competitive governance is in theory something i'm incredibly curious about i tend to think though that a lot of this stuff just comes down to who holds the guns and in today's day and age like it's hard for me to imagine a charter city that explodes creates a ton of wealth and can do that without working with another nation of some sort mm-hmm. that already has a standing militia or whatever it is. And so, um, yeah, so I, I think incredibly interesting, but probably need to be partnered with working with or cooperating with right. in some way a government that has a military that can actually defend yeah. if shit goes down. Did you read the sovereign individual? I did. Yeah. yeah. So the, yeah, the idea that we become customer customers of governments instead of, you know, or that they exist to serve us and their markets for governance and part of that being enabled by the decoupling of money and state, but then also sort of military and state. And we're seeing that a little bit right now, but is the cheering point who's got the guns? Like at some point, aren't we like 3d printing guns and buying them with Zcash or something <laughs> like, is that anytime soon or maybe, but, but I think that the, the technological arms race, like as an individual, you're always going to be behind the technological arms race. And so, you know, if, as soon as we could 3d print, print guns, drone warfare exists where the Pentagon can like identify you, you know, using AI and then like land a missile on your head. Like yeah. <laughs> you just can't outcompete. Like the, the bigger the institution, the more they can spend on weapons research, yeah. which means that the biggest institutions will always have the best access to the best weapons. Is there a world in which like Facebook, Google, or Amazon, I mean, now we're just off the reservation, but like private companies become as powerful as governments in some, or like threaten. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I think, potentially, but I think that, I think they're already doing that in some ways. It's just not warfare in the form that we're used to seeing it. Right. Like in some ways you could argue that, you know, Facebook is more powerful than the, than many branches of the U S government, uh, more powerful than some States in the U S like many States in the U S probably. And so I think that we're kind of moving from an economy in a world where 
value was based on like what resources does this country have access to? What is their land like? What is their productivity like and all that where, where you could seize a lot of the, the tools of production and you know the the returns to warfare were pretty great and i think we're moving towards a situation where you know if a lot of value is created by technologists white collar workers thought workers and the like it becomes a lot harder to take those you know take over those people and, and harvest the output that they're creating yeah. uh, and a lot of that output is not owned by the u.s government anymore it's owned by these private entities like yeah. Amazon, Facebook, Google are creating the the vast majority. Um, you know, maybe the NSA to some extent. I don't. I don't, yeah. don't have any idea. But they're creating a ton of the technological prowess that the U.S. relies on to be superior to other nations. And so, so in a lot of ways, I think that like these entities are already almost as powerful as the U.S. Yeah. You know, my guest today has been Justin Maris. Justin, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst.